Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about safety. Oh, and when it comes to safety, you can tell I'm a professional. Really? What the f Kids, only you can prevent forest fires. Now, like I was saying before I got interrupted by a very rude fire, I was talking about safety. And here I have a safety list that I made uh, specifically to talk about all the safety things regarding electronics. Hmm. Now, it's too much of a long and detailed list to talk about everything, but let's just say it might have something to do with common sense. Now that you have your proper safety warning about things that could potentially kill you, let's talk about things that could potentially kill you, like good old trusty high voltage flyback transformer. Not only is this flyback transformer commonly found in appliances like cathode ray tube TVs, but it's also very popular in the high voltage community because oftentimes beginners that start off with high voltage start off with a flyback transformer. Now it may seem a little daunting to a beginner as to what circuits to make when it comes to high voltage projects. And not only am I going to show you some circuits and some examples um, of how to drive a flyback transformer, but I'm also going to help you understand how those circuits work. And so therefore, I'm not just giving you a fish, I'm teaching you to fish. Oh my God, oh my God guys. Oh my God, I caught a big one. This is a big one. I'm trying to teach you how to understand a circuit so that maybe you can uh, build one uh, of your own, design your own, and see if it works. So first and foremost, this is a transformer. And transformers only work off of AC, meaning you will have to switch voltage and current very quickly in order to get any high voltage out. I do want to talk about really quick uh, one aspect of the transformer that's really important and that's the driving frequency of this transformer. And when it's in a cathode ray tube TV circuit board, uh, normally it's driven at anywhere from 15 to 20 kilohertz and uh, it's important to drive it at that frequency or you can drive it higher if you want to. but. Um, you have to keep in mind the frequency that you drive it at because um, if you drive it any lower than say 15 kilohertz then you're risking the transformer going into saturation and basically what happens at saturation is that the transformer can heat up and give you very poor performance. Now saturation has a lot of other details and aspects to it too, um, and I suggest researching it for yourself, uh, but it's generally out of the scope of the video. However, this one detail is actually pretty important, so that's why I wanted to mention it. And so because it's important to drive this at a certain frequency, what I usually do with my driving oscillators is I make sure to set them at anywhere from 15 to 25 kilohertz. And for anyone wondering how I specifically set up the frequency on the Arduino, what I use is the tone command. And uh, that already has a built-in 50% duty cycle, and you can just set the frequency. So, what are the two most popular switching semiconductors? Well, it's the transistor and the MOSFET. All right, so let's just start off with the transistor. Now, when you look at a typical circuit board, what you will find is uh, these little jelly bean, as I like to call them, jelly bean transistors. They're pretty small, easy to drive, have a high current gain, and are fairly common. When I say high current gain, uh, gain is basically just the relationship between the current on the base of the transistor and the current between the collector and the emitter of the transistor. Um, so, for example, if uh, this transistor had a current gain of 100, well that means if I put a current of 1 milliamp on the base, I can switch a current of up to 100 milliamps at the, um, between the collector and emitter. Now these bigger transistors, on the other hand, don't have a high current gain. Uh, typically, it can be as low as a current gain of 10. Now, obviously, these bigger transistors can handle a lot of current and a lot of voltage, um, but have a significant disadvantage because they are harder to drive. Just to give you some perspective, if you were to take a um, typical microcontroller and say you wanted to control um, this big transistor with the microcontroller, say like a square wave, 
uh, well, it just wouldn't be possible because typically these transistors need a base current of up to one amp at like 1.2, 1.5 volts to start turning on. And this creates a problem because if you consider that your typical microcontroller or relaxation oscillator or anything else that creates a signal that you want uh, to drive with the transistor uh, is typically at a quarter of an amp and, uh, and barely so, like it could be even less than that. And that is not enough to drive this big transistor. So if you want to drive this big transistor, well, what do you do? Because you have the signal and you have the big transistor, but you just don't have enough current over here to properly uh, turn this switch on and off. So what you do, what is typically done, is you use these smaller jelly bean transistors to um, switch enough current for the bigger transistor. So these smaller jelly bean transistors act like a sort of middleman between the big transistor and your uh, signal. Now, if it isn't obvious by now, transistors are current driven devices. And if you want to turn this transistor on in this diagram, well, you would have to have a current between the base and the emitter to drive a load that's um, on the collector side. And this is the proper, or at least the typical way of doing things. Um, you could put the load on the emitter side. I just want to let you know that that's possible, but that is not typically done. Well, when you're switching a load on the collector um, and you're switching this transistor on, like I mentioned, you have to have a current between the base and the emitter. And uh, when you do that, you have to take into account the diode forward voltage drop of the diode and which is typically 0.7 volts and once you take that into account well you know that's it you know you're you're switching the load on the collector side and um, and you don't have to worry about anything else when you're switching a load on the emitter side however you have to take into account that 0.7 volt uh, voltage drop and you have to take into account any resistance or voltage drop across the load and that just creates more problems and more difficulty for you. Um, so typically what is done is just driving a load on the collector side and uh, that way you, ju you just have less things to worry about. Just keep in mind that the pinouts change from transistor to transistor and uh, this is especially true if you're pulling transistors out of circuit boards like I usually do. So um, just be sure to look at the data sheet. All right, now we can talk about MOSFETs and MOSFETs are really easy to work with and that's just because they're very consistent with the pinouts and they're very easy to drive. Usually the pinout is as follows from left to right, it's gate drain source and actually when you're pulling off a random MOSFET from a random PCB board, um, it's so consistent that if I don't need to, then I won't look at the data sheet for the pinout. I will just, you know, assume that it's gate drain source from left to right. And usually that's exactly what it is. And they're very easy to drive primarily because that the gate of the MOSFET is isolated from the drain in the source. Now, um, this is unlike the transistor because with the transistor, the base is actually directly connected to the uh, collector and emitter, but with the gate on the MOSFET, it is capacitively coupled to the drain in the source. So what effectively that does is it makes the MOSFET a voltage controlled device. And because the MOSFET is a voltage controlled device, it requires very little current at the gate in order to turn the MOSFET on and off. In fact, the current at the gate can be as low as one milliamp to a couple hundred microamps and uh, it will turn the MOSFET on and off. And for this exact reason, you can actually switch the MOSFET on and off with a microcontroller, like directly connecting this microcontroller to the MOSFET and you will have no problem switching this thing on and off. Um, as long as the threshold voltage is, you know, within like five volts because the maximum voltage output of, you know, a typical microcontroller is like five volts. So if the voltage threshold um, of the of the gate is like typically around five volts, then, you know, you're all set. You can switch it with the microcontroller. If you're worried about uh, the MOSFET switching uh, on and off properly uh, by directly connecting a microcontroller to it, well, you're going to have to check the data sheet because it really varies from MOSFET to MOSFET. Another cool thing about a MOSFET is that it can typically handle a large voltage at the gate. 
So um, a typical value could be anywhere from plus or minus 20 or 30 volts even. And this is very uncommon and unlike uh, the transistor because when you're looking at a transistor data sheet, the maximum voltage that you would see specified across the basin emitter would be maybe six volts, seven volts even. Now when you're turning a MOSFET on and off, you want the voltage potential between the gate and source. And typically when you're switching anything with a MOSFET, the load is put on the drain side. And the reason for that is the exact same reason why the load on the transistor is usually put on the collector, because it just makes it easier to switch. So usually you don't see a load put on the source side of the MOSFET, but you can still do that um, under certain situations where that might be advantageous. And it's worth noting that there are certain situations where putting the load on the emitter side of the transistor is also advantageous. Uh, but usually, for our purposes, for the scope of this video, just know that putting a load on the drain side of a MOSFET and putting a load on the collector side of a transistor is usually and typically the way you properly switch a load. So here's the very first circuit that I want to go over and uh, it has a good purpose in showing you that the waveform provided by any kind of uh, microcontroller or relaxation oscillator that might, might be over here um, is important to modify that waveform in such a way that it drives the switch properly. I'll show you more details in a second, but first I just want to go over a little bit about the circuit. Um, mainly the fact that uh, we are isolating the low voltage side from the high voltage side. And we are working with a MOSFET here, so we could technically connect our PWM source from our microcontroller directly over to the MOSFET. But I never said that was a good idea, um, especially when working with high voltage and uh, inductive loads. Just to illustrate how important it is to um, safely protect your circuit, I want to show you this bag that I had full of 555 timer chips, but I lost most of the 555 timers to the flyback voltage that I didn't dampen or I didn't isolate from the low voltage side. So, you know, if you don't want to lose your precious microcontrollers, then you should uh, isolate your high voltage from your low voltage, either with an optocoupler and or a snubber. Now, the most basic kind of snubber there is, is just a diode across a, a switch to protect that switch, in this case a MOSFET, from uh, flyback voltages. Now, sometimes just putting one diode across a switch or across an inductive load is not enough to protect it properly or dampen it properly. So you um, add a capacitor or a resistor in parallel with the diode. You know, there's many different configurations uh, of snubbers and there's ways to calculate the proper values for it. But, um, you know, to be honest with you, I just put a diode and a resistor in series and I call it a day. <laughs> but you'll be surprised that the MOSFET or the switching device actually can handle a lot of abuse before it just, you know, explodes. But your PWM source, which would be the Arduino, microcontroller, whatever you have, um, is much, much more sensitive to the high voltage and the inductive spikes. So you have to make sure to protect it somehow. Now, both these resistors here in the circuit are pretty important. This 1.7K ohm resistor, first of all, limits the current from your power supply, and it also controls how much of the waveform will move up and down. And I'll show you that on the oscilloscope to, to tell you exactly what I mean. And this resistor here is important to limit the current through this IR diode, uh, because, you know, diodes are controlled by how much current you let through them, and if you have no resistor here at all, well, you're going to most likely burn out this, this diode. So here is the full circuit assembled. Uh, there's the MOSFET that switches the flyback. This is the power supply that um, actually gives power to the gate of that MOSFET. And it also is switched by um, this optocoupler. And uh, we have obviously the optocoupler there with the Arduino. The Arduino is switching at a frequency of 25 kilohertz. I have my oscilloscope connected across the optocoupler, and uh, which is also connected across the gate and the source pin of the MOSFET. The detector side of the optocoupler is being given about 27 volts DC to switch on and off, 
and that is also going to the gate of the MOSFET because the gate of this particular MOSFET can handle plus or minus 30 volts. So I should be fine there. Now the resistor over here that's limiting the current from the Arduino to the optocoupler has a resistance of 85 ohms if I remember correctly. There are three resistors over here on the power supply um, and these will come in handy later on the oscilloscope to show you what these different valued resistors do to the waveform that is being produced on the output of the optocoupler. So this is the waveform that we see on the gate and source of the MOSFET. Right away, we're on five volts per division and you can see that we have five, 10, 12, 13 volts at the very peak of this waveform. And you know that we are putting in 27 volts on the gate of the MOSFET. And this is because we are limiting the current with a resistor and so therefore the voltage will suffer. However, we still got a pretty nice waveform, right? And the MOSFET, as we know, has a threshold of somewhere around like 5 volts. Damn, this signal likes to drift a lot. Look how sensitive this is. Like, I get it perfectly like this, and then I just leave it alone, not even touching it, and then it starts to move by itself. <laughs> Now if we get a little bit closer to the waveform and go down to one volt per division, we can see that the very bottom of the waveform is actually sitting on one volt. And just for reference, this is our zero, and this is where the bottom of the waveform is sitting at. It's pretty much at one volt. Now this is not ideal, you would expect this waveform to go all the way down to zero, but in fact, it's not. But that actually may not even matter because according to the data sheet for this specific MOSFET, the lower threshold voltage to turn the MOSFET on is two volts. And so since we're well below two volts, we know for certain that the MOSFET is definitely going to switch off. And since the higher threshold voltage is at four volts, according to the data sheet for this MOSFET, well, we know that even though the waveform is not perfect, it will turn on. So hopefully from this demonstration, you can see how important this waveform is to properly switch the MOSFET on and off. Now, let's go and actually test this thing. Now I think that was a beautiful test that shows you if a MOSFET is switching on and off correctly, it will produce very little heat. That MOSFET was actually cold to the touch and it was still switching an enormous amount of power. 
Now let's make it a little bit more interesting so you can see what happens when the MOSFET isn't switching on and off correctly, when the waveform is kind of different. Now to change that waveform, like I mentioned previously, we're going to change the resistance of, well, these resistors. That's why there's three resistors here to choose um, three different resistances and therefore change the waveform. So that first test was on the 1.7K ohm resistor. And on the second test, we're gonna be going with the 2.2K ohm resistor. So we're going to a higher resistance. So this is the waveform that we see with the higher resistance. And this waveform only peaks at about 10 volts. So the voltage is lower. And that makes sense because we're at a higher resistance and we're limiting more current. But as a result, let's look uh, closer at the waveform. And so we're going down to one volt per division again. And you can see that the waveform is actually closer to zero now. So what does a higher resistance give us? Well, it makes sure that the bottom of the waveform is actually closer to zero and makes sure that the MOSFET is definitely turned off but it also limits how much the MOSFET is being turned on because we are limiting the current severely with a higher resistance. We are also changing the shape of the waveform and that may affect performance too. So as you saw from the high resistance test, the performance from the flyback was actually fairly weak compared to the first test. Now we're going to move on to the final resistor and this is a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor. This resistor has a lower value than any of the other resistors over here. So we're going to see what a lower resistance does to the waveform and to the switching MOSFET. Now what you can immediately see, we're at five volts per division again, and the waveform peaks at almost 15 volts. And if we take a closer look at this waveform on the very bottom, you can see that it's actually sitting at like three volts almost. So what does this mean for the MOSFET? Well now, since the waveform bottoms out at three volts, the MOSFET is going to have a little trouble turning completely off. 
Don't worry guys, I'm completely fine. It just charred the skin a little bit. No cuts, no blood, no nothing. Uh, not even a shock, it's just, uh, just a little bit of black charring. But that's it, I'm fine. Now I was debating whether or not to actually show you guys that clip in the video because it is kind of scary and graphic, but it also displays a very important fact about this circuit. Um, and I realized, reviewing the footage, of what exactly happened. So what happened was that this high voltage lead was way too close to the flyback. And um, if you saw, the arc that was created with the close proximity was very thick, white, and hot. And it just means that there was a lot of current flowing through there because the arc was very short. And because of that, it was acting like a short circuit. And because, as you know, the MOSFET was in a configuration where it had trouble turning off, well, it just caused the MOSFET to heat up very quickly and combust. All right, now I just wanna go over these two waveforms and summarize what we've learned. So when you're dealing with a waveform like this, when it's spiky, um, the MOSFET is spending less time being on. And that's just because of the waveform. You see, when uh, the waveform goes up and the voltage goes up to turn on the MOSFET, it's spending less time up here and uh, the MOSFET or transistor, therefore, is spending less time being turned on and, uh, and it quickly goes back down. And so that transfers less current and you get skinny arcs and less heat, basically. Now with this more defined square wave waveform, you get um, thicker arcs and more current flow because it's the polar opposite. When the voltage rises to turn on the MOSFET or transistor, well, it spends more time up here. Uh, therefore, the semiconductor spends uh, more time being on and transferring more current as a result. So, well, you get more heat. But this also depends. This depends on the semiconductor. There's other factors to consider, of course. The waveforms can have more amplitude, can drive the switch harder. Uh, the more or less duty cycle you have can affect performance. Changing the frequency can affect performance. And of course, the on resistance of the transistor or MOSFET also uh, can factor into the heat. Say, for example, the MOSFET had a resistance of 510 ohms, which is pretty big, then it can generate actually a lot of heat. And that can drive the MOSFET into thermal runaway and it could destroy itself because of that heat. So generally, if you want less heat out of a MOSFET, then a lower on resistance is more preferable. All right, I'm going to have to end this here because this video is already way too long and I don't want it to get any longer. It could easily go for an hour or so uh, just with me explaining technical details. Uh, you, you know I can talk about transformer saturation for an hour straight, so I'm not... <laughs> so the next part of this video is going to be about transistors and how to switch them on and off properly. At, at least for my purposes, for the purposes of, you know, driving the flyback. And especially driving those power transistors, which are a little bit more tricky to, you know, turn on and off. If there's only one thing that you get out of this video, I hope it would be that you notice how important that waveform is to switch the semiconductor on and off. The waveform is everything to that semiconductor and it tells you so much about how the arc uh, or how the switching will perform. So hopefully I explained things in a practical way and I showed enough demonstrations to prove that what I was saying is factual. But I know I'm still an amateur and I'm still learning constantly about electronics and so if there's something in the video that's misleading or maybe wrong or whatever it may be, maybe a, a detail that I didn't mention, please let me know in the comments below and I just want to let you guys know your feedback is, is great. Even the negative feedback is wonderful. I, <laughs> I love the criticism because it just helps me learn. So my hope is that this video can inspire you to go out there and experiment with your own circuits and not be afraid to take stuff apart and take components from other products and just combine them in a circuit to make something functional. You know, that's the way I started and it led me here. So anyway, as always, I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next one.